Hi, my name is Freya Proudman, and I did my study on young women's optimisms for their futures. So the biggest thing that helped me to figure out what I wanted to do was that within the last century, women have gained so many different opportunities, both political, um, educational opportunities, and even their participation in the workforce has increased. But despite this, a study by Stevenson and Wolfers found that adult women are actually experiencing a decline in happiness, which is really interesting considering you'd think that more opportunities means more happiness, but that wasn't really the case. And um, other studies done by the Monitoring the Youth, or Monitoring the Future uh, Foundation found that uh, high schoolers are actually going through a dip in happiness as well. And I wanted to look into this more and I decided that I was going to test on the younger generation, specifically girls ages 15 through 18. And I wanted to figure out, get a sense of how optimistic they are for their futures and also what factors they felt restricted them or held them back from getting the futures they want. Because I believe that with this young generation, if we focus on them and we identify the things that hold them back, we can also identify things that help them combat those factors and to get over those things that hold them back so that they can stay optimistic for longer in life and they don't experience that decline in happiness that these adult women are now doing. So I had 17 female volunteers, all ages 15 through 18 years, and they filled out a survey containing five different questions that asked them things about their goals in life, um, how optimistic they ranked themselves on a scale from one to 10 about whether or not they could reach those goals, things that held themselves back, why they thought those things, and more. So pretty much I found that um, young women are actually really optimistic, which is interesting considering the fact that they recognize so many factors that hold themselves back in life. and. It's interesting to see that one of the biggest factors girls felt that held them back was actually themselves. So many girls noted that um, they didn't feel that they would be good enough. They didn't feel that they had the ability to uh, reach their goals in life, which was really sad to hear. But despite this, it's interesting to see that they still are very optimistic that they're going to succeed. So I wanted to look more into that. And um, I found that a lot of the girls that said that they um, didn't feel they would succeed, a lot of them identified that they really believed that their future mattered on how hard they worked. And although girls felt that they held themselves back, they believed that they were able to work hard enough to overcome that, to overcome their self-doubt in order to be optimistic and still get the future they wanted for themselves, which was really cool. Um, a lot of girls also identified external factors such as money and opportunities presented them to be uh, things that hold themselves back. Um, the biggest thing that I also saw was society. So many girls talked about how um, society is actually a thing that holds them back because society pushes for competition between girls. They um, they tell girls that you always have to be the prettiest or the smartest and they're always pushing for girls to be the better than each other and to compare themselves to each other and girls mention that this comparison between them and this pressure to be the best is really hurtful because they feel as if if they're not the best then they're not as optimistic about their future because they feel that if they were the best then they'd be able to have all the chances in life and so um, that was really hard to see and I think that leads a lot to why girls think that they're not good enough because they're constantly comparing themselves to others and it really shows that, you know, we need to live in a society where it's great to be the best, but it's more important that girls are their best, their own personal best. So I realized a lot about that, and it was really interesting to see, though. And it's nice to see that, you know, although girls do recognize themselves as a major factor that holds them back, in the end, they're still optimistic. They still believe and they still hope deep down that they're going to be able to succeed later in life. Right, and uh, how long did this study take you? Um, I started this uh, study in the fall. About I started getting data in about December, and I finished in February. So the data process took me about two months or two or three months or so. And then, but the whole study took me since the beginning of the school year to now. What I've done here is I've done a study of earthworm regeneration. I was studying not what could be regenerated because that's already been well studied. What I was studying was how the regeneration process affects worms themselves. So what I did is I tested them on various things or at various intervals to determine, you know, how it changed as they were regenerating. I used species Lumbricus terrestris. Uh, there are many species of earthworms, but I chose this one because it's the most common and it burrows close to the ground. So if you see an earthworm, this is the most likely one to go with. I chose earthworms because while we've studied a lot about planarians and flatworms and other, uh, you know, smaller worms and know a lot about their regeneration, uh, earthworms are much larger and much more complex. And while they can't regenerate as well as like planarians, which can regenerate basically from one cell, they're very complex and much easier to compare to humans. And uh, they're, they, they can't regenerate all the way, but if we understand the difference between them and flatworms in that they can, they can regenerate a little, we can regenerate even less, and planarians can regenerate a lot, 
it's a better stepping stone to understand how we could possibly get a uh, regeneration of humans in the future. So what I did is I cut them at various intervals, as you can see in this place. I had four groups, a control group, one that was cut here, one that was cut here, and one that was cut here. Uh, I put them on either side of the clitellum, which is the band closest to the head, which is where the sexual organs are. Um, it's, uh, it's only present in mature earthworms, and it's usually a good thing to measure things off. I put two on either side of that, and then one close to the tail. Now, uh, the tail is what I'm most interested in. It's not what I'm most interested in, sorry. Because uh, past segment 55, full tail regeneration is possible because it's not, nothing really is happening here. Whereas all the internal organs and important parts are here near the head and near the tellum. Uh So after I cut them, I was planning to you know, get data from them every two to three days. Unfortunately, while I knew that they need a, little, a lot of moisture, I didn't know quite how much water they needed. Now, earthworms need a lot of water because they breathe through their skin, and they and well, oxygen can't come through the skin unless it's moist. So while I, I didn't have enough moisture, and they all died early on in the experiment. But, uh, For Amanda's mom. So they can get moisture from the soil. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a lot why you see a lot of them dead on the sidewalk after rain, is because yeah. they're looking for darkness and wetness, and they don't realize they're above ground until it, start, it stops raining, and then it's too late. How long did this all take you? Uh, I was planning, I, so it took me a little while to do the background research and acquire the worms. I actually started experimenting on February 7th, uh, but it was on February 15th that they were all found dead, so I, didn't re I could only gather data once between them. Hi, my name is Hirtesh, and today I'm going to be talking to you about bio my project. It's on biofuels. So sooner or later, our world is going to run out of um, fossil fuels, and we need to find something that can replace them so we can produce our electricity. So my project's on biofuels, and biofuels are recently dead plants, which um, are going to need to be replaced. Uh, well, they are automatically replaced because we can keep growing them. And so what I did, I wanted to measure how much... Um, how much it heats up water and also how much carbon dioxide is released. So what I did is I created the biofuels and once I created it, I also got another product with it, glycerin. Glycerin could be used in many other items, but on biofuels right now, I burned it to see how much temperature change it created with water I also, and I found out that olive oil was the most effective. I also um, burned it to see how much carbon dioxide was released and I saw that olive oil released the most carbon dioxide. But when compared to fossil fuels, it released 12%, much less. So, from my analysis, the best possible fuel is, for biofuel is olive oil. Wow. Uh, how long did this uh, take you, this research? Um, the research, like my background research, I took at least like one, one and a half hours so I can understand what everything is. Then I spent, um, take my project actually like doing the experiment took about three hours. And after that, I looked at all my data, analyzed it, and took like 13 hours to get this poster in shape.